okay it's it's six o'clock um, so I think we're ready to start the feed um, so just would to welcome everybody to tonight's ISAG meeting um, first item on the agenda is uh, apologies for absence um, I have an apology from Councillor Ben Price who's still uh, Unfortunately, I am to, to, to isolate at the moment due to COVID issues. Um, I've had an apology from Dan Maycock, who's just running a little bit late, so I think he'll be he'll be with us shortly. Uh, any other apologies? I think we think we're we're all good. Other than that, um, okay. So um, item two, which is a minutes of the previous meeting. 15th of June. Um, can we have a, a mover and a seconder? Happy Simon. to move or thank you, chair. Simon and Andy. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll sign those off when I've uh, straight after this meeting. I think. Um, item three is declarations of interest. Um, I've not received any. Um, if you feel you've got anything in the, these items, I, I, I think it's unlikely people have, but l let us know. Um, item four, which is an update from me, uh, if I have anything, and currently I don't. Uh, there is a couple of other things I want to update um, committee on, but I'll do that at the appropriate time in working plan or uh, etc. cetera. Um, Item five is responses to reports of the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Um, if you recall, we received a um, presentation on the Future High Street Fund terms of reference. I, um, I went to Cabinet and provided a verbal report to Cabinet of the comments that we, we had made, um, and Cabinet indeed approved the report with the recommendations um, and I think, I think those um, those minutes have, have have gone out as well. Um, item six is consideration of matters referred to ISAG from cabinet and council, and there's none currently. So that's our sort of formal part of the of, of the meeting that we, we we normally go through. Item seven is our first um, topic to look at. Um, which is the fire safety and inspection update, and we've we've got Paul with us tonight to, to give us an update. If you, if committee remembers, or or for those that weren't on the committee previously, we had a an update December 2019, um, and as requested um, a further update when when there was any legislation had, had, had changed. Uh, or other updates were available, so it's a uh, it's a bit of a a refresher on where where we are now and and, and any changes. So, Paul, have to hand over to you and uh, and give us give us the updates. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's uh, been a while since I came came last time to discuss this. Uh, and in all honesty, very little has changed uh, since the last time I came. Uh, so there's very little to report in in the way of updates. Uh, that doesn't mean we've not been doing anything. Uh, it's really, I suppose, for the last sort of since December 2019, we've been operating business as usual. So we've been doing our, just our normal uh, building inspections, fire risk assessments, and all the works associated with that. Uh, I mentioned last time I came the fire, uh, the Building Safety Act, and w that was sort of weighted in anticipation, uh, and it's sort of. I suppose the timing of this meeting is quite apt because that was announced on Monday of this week. So obviously not a great deal has happened in terms of practical terms, uh, but there is some update on that at least now. Back in around about December, we were asked by uh, MHCLG to do some inspections of our buildings, our high-risk buildings, and they're classing the higher-risk buildings as basically buildings over 18 metres in height uh, as part of a government return programme. What they were really looking for in that was predominantly to identify those buildings with cladding uh, and those sorts of issues to start to identify the potential size of the, the problem out there. But of course, none of our buildings have that type of cladding. So our return was fairly 
planned, to be honest with you. It was, obviously, we had to go through the motions, uh, but there wasn't really a great deal to report uh, on that sense. But we completed that, and that sort of set some of the framework around what we need to do going forward. Uh, so since November, uh, sorry, December, no real incidents of note. I think we've probably had a couple of small minor house fires where they've been largely just you know, kitchen type fires, but nothing of any consequence, no, no, no serious injuries or anything like that. And certainly nothing to do with the building itself. It has been effectively the people in the building and just those, those type of typical incidents that you will get. Uh, despite the COVID sort of outbreak, which I know has caused some issues out there in the big wide world for this type of work, actually we've been able to carry on doing our fire risk assessments as normal uh, and addressing any work that falls out from that. Uh, we had quite a strict sort of process in place in all of our sheltered schemes. Uh, so whilst our scheme managers weren't particularly on site, we were using one of our contractors to do the regular uh, safety inspections. That covered fire risk and all other type of uh, risk assessments in those buildings. Uh, place like the high rise and other flatted accommodation, we've just been able to sort of carry on with those fire risk assessments as normal. So no real issues there with that as part of the uh, COVID side of things. We've started the programme of fire door replacements. Again, I think you might remember that's something that's been kicking around for a while now. Uh, we had works programmed in, and then sort of post-Grenfell, there was a major shake-up of the door industry uh, with certification of doors. Fortunately, we hadn't actually placed any orders for doors at that point, so we were able to sort of put a hold on that until that sorted itself out. We're now at a point where there are doors now certified, and we can move those forward and we put a new capital scheme forward so that's now in sight and I think we've got some properties now where we've actually started that work as a bit of a sample uh, just to sort of test and make sure we're, we're doing it right and that they're all getting signed off and certified and that will just roll out across the six high-rise blocks and Errington because uh, again that that's over that 18 meter so it falls within the uh, sort of the, the high at risk buildings that they're called Fire safety bill, which is different to the building safety, has gone through. The, uh, has gone through. We did have that reviewed by our external fire risk assessment consultants, and their view was actually there was nothing really or no further actions from our side on that because we were already doing what was needed as part of that anyway. It's just our part of our normal fire risk assessments. Uh, but again, that's something we'll just keep keep a monitor monitoring uh, and make sure we're compliant. Uh, there's a couple of things that have come through an audit process. Uh, around things like electrical safety inspections uh, and our lift servicing policies. Whilst we've been doing that work and we have a process in place to get that work done, there's no formal policy in place so we're actually sort of formalising the policy and effectively it will reflect what we do in practice. Uh, what we are looking at is particularly around the electrical safety is to strengthen that uh, more along the lines of the way we deal with gas safety mm. uh, and that will include where possible looking at potential legal action to gain entry to properties if tenants aren't allowing us access to, to do the electrical inspections. That's already sort of enshrined in law with the gas and it's quite easy to get court orders to get into properties with gas. Tends to be a bit more difficult with electrical, uh, but again, I think you know th there are mechanisms we can use and we're investigating those. The building safety bill, particularly in higher risk buildings, will change that, I think, and make it a lot easier for us in those type of buildings. So that's sort of bit of background as to where we are. As I said, the building safety bill, which was something we've been waiting for, uh, announced on Monday. Uh, at the same time, they announced the building safety regulator. So the, I think that's going to sit under the health and safety executive uh, and that they will be the regulator overseeing that building safety work. We've been advised, sort of basically through the notes that have come through from government in their guidance notes, that it's probably around about nine months to pass through the system and get to the point where it's uh, agreed, and then probably another 12 to 18 months to actually implement sort of the outcomes of that, uh, partly because there's a lot of stuff that's, that's, that's going to need implementation. Uh, based on what we've seen, and I've got to, I've got to admit, I haven't read it all since Monday, so I've only read really the guidance notes. There's about 200, I think, about 270 odd pages in the guidance, about 250 pages in the actual bill itself. So I think the guidance, for some reason, is no excuse. Larger, <laughs> larger than the bill. Uh, but looking through it, I don't think it's vastly different to what we reported last time when we came uh, to, to this committee. So it's broadly the same sorts of things in there. I don't think they've changed it significantly. Uh, 
with that in mind, we'd already started thinking about that, what that would look like to us. And, you know, obviously we reported that last time. We do have budget in place for a building safety manager, which is a, a formal role that's likely to be a, a requirement as part of the Building Safety Bill or Building Safety Act. At the moment, we've not yet appointed to that role because we still don't really know exactly what's required of it and, you know, sort of what the, what the detail behind that is. And there's no point appointing someone and potentially having the wrong person who doesn't meet the criteria. So that's something that will sit there. So there's probably an underspend on that this year, but we will we will have to appoint to, at some point because that it, it will be a requirement. Uh, we've already appointed some consultants to start assisting us in this, and they've actually commenced some work in terms of uh, more detailed surveys of the building. So we've always had to do fire risk assessments in the buildings, but they're doing something called a Type 4 survey which put quite crudely is they poke holes in things and start looking around in a bit more detail inside the structure of the building rather than sort of just more the sort of outwardly looking at the building. Uh, that, that will obviously identify any sort of risks that haven't already been identified. Hopefully there won't be too many just by nature of the type of buildings, but you know, and certainly there's nothing of any major consequence they've reported to us so far. Uh, so that piece of work is underway and that they, they've sort of happily been working away at that for us for past couple of months to be honest with you on that again access is a little bit tricky in terms of covid and sort of trying to get into properties but they, they've had to sort of put safe systems of work to do that so that's that's underway the same consultant will also assist us in the production of our building safety manuals and one of the things that's sort of mentioned in the building safety bill is this thing called that golden thread which effectively takes you from the you know inception phase of a high risk building right through construction design construction handover and then ongoing management uh, so we'll have to have those sort of building safety manuals for all those buildings and it basically it covers all your risk assessments uh, and how you're managing those risks in those buildings and it talks about it being sort of you know, reasonable and proportionate uh, again that's always one of those i suppose when it comes to it that's that's the challenge isn't it as to what what is reasonable and proportionate uh and i think some of the works we've done in the past around sprinklers and that type of stuff actually you know puts us in good stead in terms of the you know the risk of those buildings but you know we'll, we'll have to see how that one works through that's as part of that process we'll also have to keep sort of better digital records that are more easily accessible uh to us our residents fire service uh you know and those sorts of people so again they'll help us with that process and sort of get those in in good order the building safety side goes beyond just fire safety so it looks at that wider building safety uh, and again so as part of that we are commissioning a piece of work to do some structural surveys on our high-rise blocks it's been about five or six years since we've done the last lot so they are due now so again that'll pick up those hopefully that won't pick up any ser sort of serious issues it didn't five years ago so you know shouldn't be much change but again it's just part of that process just to say yeah we've done that piece of work and we're okay as i mentioned before electrical inspections again particularly in the higher risk buildings electrical inspections are important both for the general building safety the safety of residents but also for fire safety because clearly you know electrical fires are one of sort of a major cause of fires so that'll be part of that process and as i say i think whilst we we can look to use legislation to deal with the electrical inspections gain access it's looking as though the the building safety act will actually give us greater powers or a, a much stronger position to force people's hands on that one uh, and actually you know sort of force the position around electrical inspections uh, so it's perhaps not quite we won't we won't be in as weak a position as we're in at the moment uh, with those and whilst they're not included at the moment we are looking at extending that work out to some of the lower rise blocks. Whereas on the high rise, we will do all of those because we have to. On the low rise blocks, we'll probably do some samples for now, see what that's telling us and sort of do a risk-based approach on those. But again, looking at the way the act is or the bill is worded, it does suggest that it will start to roll out. So it's looking at those high risk buildings at the moment, but it's likely to roll out to offices, care homes, uh, schools hospitals so it's it, it will roll out presumably across that broader spectrum uh, over time one of the things that will need to happen is we'll need to sort of develop a much more proactive sort of communications route with our residents in our blocks 
So at the moment, I think it's probably fair to say we're, we're reasonably reactive to our residents uh, and when they've got issues or concerns that they raise with us, we do react to that. But this sort of requires a much more proactive approach uh, to that engagement. So again, we have got, you know, we have got somebody who's working quite closely with the high rise residents at the moment. Uh, so I, I see that role playing a part in it alongside the building safety manager. So that, that's, that's an area where we need to develop it out. And I think really it's now starting to digest exactly what, 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 what it's telling us. So working with those consultants to develop those building safety manuals and that proportionate response to the building safety bill. Uh, to make sure that by the time we actually get to the point where it's implemented and you know the government's saying it now needs to be in place we're all set and ready to go and that everything's stacked up uh, because there are some legal penalties in there if you don't uh, through you know things like even prosecution if you're not not doing it properly so it you know it, it's quite strong you know it's quite strongly worded the law I mean unfortunately I think you know over the last couple of days certainly most of the most of the sort of the conversation around this seems to have been around leaseholders and the impact on leaseholders, uh, rather than sort of the wider implications of it, because uh, obviously there is, you know, there is a potential big problem for certain leaseholders around sort of uh, the the cost of removing cladding. Clearly, on our buildings, we're still the major stakeholder in all of our blocks, so the leaseholders are fairly small proportion in those blocks. So it's in our interest to make sure that we're doing everything right for our tenants. Uh, and that we don't have excessive costs and unnecessary excessive costs when we do this type of work. Uh, so to some degree, it probably protects leaseholders to, to a degree on that. But again, we do need to sort of look at what the implications of that will be uh, for leaseholders uh, and how that works around some of the costs on that. And potentially there are, there are likely to be costs associated with implementing all of this. And it's looking as though some of those costs can be passed on to leasehold. So again, we'll need to look at how that's going to work. Uh, so, so I think that's where we are at the moment. And like I say, I think you know, timing-wise, unfortunately, like I say, with only sort of hitting hitting on Monday, it's still a little bit early, really. So I think you know, sort of over the next few months, we'll develop it out further and then bring it back as to where where we are with it and what the what the proposals are. What I've not covered in this is the implications for people like planning and building control. Uh, this is purely around our own assets, but there are, like I say, implications there as well from that start of that process right the way through. Uh, and I know, sort of, I know Anna and her team have sort of been briefed already on that. And again, building control, I know, are, are sort of being heavily briefed by their organisations around the implications for them. So it's quite, it's quite broad-reaching. So, like I say, I think I think it is really now. Let's see how it goes what's required and then bring it, bring it forward to future meetings thank you Paul um, thanks for that update and, and yeah we will welcome you back at uh, another future future date um, before I open the uh, for any questions and comments to the rest of the room I've just got a couple I, I just want to get out of the way um, one one's perhaps sounds a bit silly but I think potentially could have some impact you mentioned fire do the fire door scheme, and I know on the high rises we are, we've had all sorts of issues with lifts and lifts being of different sizes between blocks. Are our high rises? Do they have standard size doors that could you know? Can we just buy off the shelf doors, or are they all custom? The the six blocks, I think, are all broadly the same, but again, that they will have been, because they're timber doors, they will have been fitted to the frames, yeah. uh, so that there will be some tinkering with them. They are, I think, fairly standard sizes over there, so that shouldn't be too much of an issue, And like I say, but we have got a supplier supplying those now. Uh, but again, because they have to be properly certified, that's where the issue has come for us, in that, like I say, that whole, the, there were lots of doors on the market that were had the certification post Grenfell a lot of them went back for testing and didn't pass uh, I think the issue was they passed in one direction but not the other and so they were taken off the market so you know in fairness to the companies involved they actually withdrew their product and went back through the process uh, so that's sort of where the delays come from so it's not about getting the right size and stuff like that. it's about actually getting the door that we were comfortable with saying yes this is now meets all the certifications for installation uh, 
subject to any future changes. And I suppose that's always the risk, isn't it? You know, that sort of five, ten years down the t- down the line, it could change again. But you know, we can only go on what we know today in terms of that's the certification scheme, uh, and that's what we're using. As far as the lifts go, I think you have to bear in mind they're not fire lifts. They're not designed as fire lifts. Uh, they skip floor lifts, which means they don't stop at every floor, so they're odds and evens, so they can't be used for that purpose. Uh, we do have a delayed evacuation in our high-rise blocks. That hasn't changed, so effectively people shouldn't be using the lift to escape, uh, and they're not designed as fire escape lifts. Uh, obviously, if the fire service go in a block and they consider it to be the most appropriate means of evacuation, they would take that lead in, in that situation, but they're not designed for that purpose. Okay, th- thanks, Paul. I've just got this thing in the back of my head that if the doors were an inch bigger, then our, our cost would skyrocket kind of thing. So I've just got a, got a bit of a worry. The, 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 other, the other thing I wanted to just quiz you on was, as I recall last time you were with us, you mentioned something about um, like 3D mapping of, of, of the buildings. You haven't mentioned it today, and I know, I know that was something that was very much up in the air at that time. Is, is that, are we gonna have to move forward with that or not? Because I remember that was, that was quite a significant cost, I feel. Yeah, that, that's part of that digital record keeping that I've mentioned. Okay. So right. the view is that yes, most people seem to be doing a 3D sort of scan of the building so that as part of digital records, that sort of forms all part of that. We haven't started that yet. Like I say, we're doing the survey work first, putting the building safety manuals together, and then that, that piece of work would follow. If it's the most appropriate way of doing it, it may not end up being, and we may just have normal uh, sort of uh, normal 2D plans. But like I say, that, that seems to be the way most people are doing it and it seems to be the the preferred method, but it's not it's not stipulated as far as I can tell that you have to do it that way. Uh, but certainly that's just part of that digital record keeping I mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll just open it up, Tina. Thanks, Chair. Just two quick questions, Paul. Um, how often do we inspect our lifts? Is there a time frame we have to do it in? Um, that's the first one, and how often? And the second one, can you just give us an update on the sprinklers and how many people actually took those up? Because we've obviously got private residents and they were up in arms about it from what I remember when we talked about sprinklers last time. So can we just have a quick update on the uptake on sprinklers for the high rise and in Erringdon? I'll have to report back on the uptake on sprinklers because offhand I don't know. Uh, it was very good in the end uh, because we weren't charging. Uh, so, no, I mean, the, the decision was made through the cabinet process that we wouldn't charge leaseholders for the installation of sprinklers. We insisted on it for our tenants, uh, and with leaseholders, we got into a good proportion of them in the end, so there wasn't there wasn't that many that didn't have it done, uh, and there's been a few since we, fit, since we finished where we've gone back and fitted them, so it was, it was very good. But what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll have a look through the records on that one and just see how many there were uh, that, that haven't been done yet, but it's, it's very few. Uh, as far as the lifts go, it depends. Some lifts are on monthly cycles, some are on longer. So I think some are on three monthly. Again, it's risk assessment based. Uh, so some of the newer lifts are on a longer cycle. Uh, again, it's you, ha- you have to look at sort of the lift itself and what's required on those. But all of them are serviced on a regular basis. Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, first quick question. Can I clarify, with regard to what you said about um, testing the the non-higher risk buildings, you mentioned last time you came about the three-storey buildings on the Glasgow estate. Would they be ones where you would be going and surveying one or two to make and then deciding if you need to do it? So that's the first thing. Um, And the second question, follow Councillor Clements' approach, um, the second question um, is related to buildings like the town hall, where they're part of our estate. Obviously, there's not many people in them, so it's a different risk. But presumably, being an older building poses its challenges. So could you just tell us how you deal with the heritage buildings and where they fall in the pattern? Thank you. 
Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, in terms of the blocks, we haven't got the d detailed list yet of which we're doing, but I think the view was that we would do those blocks where they have shared entrances. Uh, so where you've got the, the round dual way and place like that, where you've got blocks where it's just four flats where they've all got their own front door, we probably wouldn't look at those initially unless we were, you know, legislation requires us to down the line. We've got a number of blocks where you've got the walk-ups and then the corridors. Those are the ones we predominantly would want to look at because, again, you've got those shared, shared so communal so spaces. Would be one yeah, I mean, uh, Macefield, Macefield Drive are the ones that always spring to mind in terms yeah. of where you, you've got a flight of stairs and then you have to walk along a, a run past people's yeah. front doors to get to your flat if you're at the end. Those are the ones that we consider probably are the higher risk if you're looking at blocks. So those are probably the ones where you'd want to do right. more, more, okay. more inspections. So yeah, that, that, that's probably where we'd be looking at on it, but that, that's something we need to work through. And again, if that throws out any sort of potential risks, then clearly we'd do more. We already do fire risk assessments on those anyway, because again, they are blocks with shared spaces, so we have to do fire risk assessments. Uh, so that, that's something that's already done, but this is that next sort of higher level fire risk assessment. In terms of our heritage property, same as all of our corporate property, we have to do fire risk assessments on them because as part of just occupying a building, you have to do that as part of that process. Uh, so there's fire risk assessments, obviously we do the electrical inspections, but those are more around sort of health and safety in the workplace than anything uh, because there's a requirement to do it, so this building's the same. Uh, so that, that's just under the routine matter of course, uh, again, you know, on a it's six monthly we do the fire fire risk assessments on those can i just ask one supplementary joe last time you came you said one of the biggest problems with fire risk in the high rise but also some of the low level blocks was the blocking of exits and damage to if it's by mobility scooters and other things have you had some success in working with the tenants groups to to, to reduce that a bit yeah, the, within the estates management team, they've actually got a person now who predominantly works over in the high rise doing that sort of residence work and trying to get sort of resolve some of those issues. I won't say it's perfect because I'm sure people, when we're not looking, still do those sorts of things. But yeah, I mean, it's th th more work is being done around that now and there is that engagement. But as I say, I think what will come from this this new piece of legislation will be a lot stricter engagement. And also, I think previously where... I suppose there wasn't really a great deal of uh, onus on the on the residents in the block. This seems to be pushing more and saying, actually, you've got to work with us now, and it, you you are part of this. It's not just a case of well, you know, you're you're a resident in the block. It doesn't nothing applies to you. You can do whatever you want, and we're the landlord, and it's all our all for us to deal with. The, there seems to be that requirement around collaboration, and they play their part in it. So, in the same way as they've got to work, you know, we, we you know, there's a right for them to come to us and engage with us. They also need to play their part in it, and I think that's that's going to be part of this process and making sure that that happens, mm. uh, and that they understand the implications and their role in building safety, and what we're there to do for them. Uh, but like I say, without them, it, it won't work because they live there. 24 7 we can't be there 24 7 so they have to do you know they have to look after themselves to some degree and work with us to make sure they do that what we can do is make sure they're educated around what that looks like for us uh, and again i think that's always been there if you look at sort of the stuff that on our website and the stuff we've sent out to the high rise we've done a lot of that in the past around you know rubbish storage to keeping doors shut and all that sort of stuff and it's really just sort of building on that and making sure that that's drummed home to people that look it is important not just for you but for also all the other people in the block um i just want to pick up on something actually that the, the point simon made about the heritage side of things is there um is there some compromise between if we if we or go moving forward we've got to start poking holes in walls to start inspecting things there's some compromise with regard to one are we allowed to do that with a particular listed or heritage building again satisfying the the legis the safety legislation on the other side how how's, how does that get managed or don't we know yet <laughs> It's always been, because like I say, this has always sort of fallen under really the Health and Safety at Work Act and, you know, sort of various bits of fire fire legislation anyway. Uh, 
it's about what's reasonable and proportionate. And, you know, yeah, for the most part, there shouldn't be too many issues, but clearly, you know, what you're not going to be able to do is sort of start drilling holes in the sort of the big stone walls. But then from a risk assessment point of view, you'd assume that, you know, it's probably safe to assume that they're not going to burn anyway. So, you know, there's, there's that proportionality, isn't that? Fire stopping and stuff like that's obviously a big thing. Uh, but those will be holes that have already been drilled through sort of over the years. So it's, it's looking at those sorts of things. But yeah, there's, there's got to be that element of proportionality to it. That clearly, you're not going to start knocking holes in things that you you know that have been there 900 years that you could never ever put back into the, the condition they were in originally uh, thank thank you um any other questions and comments no dan uh thank you chair just like to apologize for being late to start off with um just on the electrical safety checks um, was it in April that landlords, they have to have an electrical safety check? If ours isn't within five years and the tenant hasn't let us in and there is a fire, where do we stand with that? Cheers. Yeah, that, that was relating to private landlords. Uh, so as it stands at the moment, if tenants don't let us in, we're not sure whether or not there's any legal route to gain access. Uh, you know, there's there's various bits of legislation. I think certain certain authorities use the Environmental Protection Act to gain access to properties, uh, but it's unlike the gas where you've got the gas safety and use regulations, which are very specific around stuff like that. The same doesn't apply on the electrical side of things. So it's, it's a lot easier to take someone through the court process uh, for gas. What we're looking at is using similar mechanisms uh, but potentially having to use different bits of legislation to do it. Uh, it. It's always a difficult one. Again, it will come down to that sort of what's reasonable and proportionate. In the same way as with gas, we, there are properties where you can't gain access and you, or you, what you have to do, be able to do is show that you've taken all reasonable measures to gain access uh, and that would usually be right through to that legal court process and what comes after that to some degree is what the courts will allow you to do. Uh, you know, and as uh, putting it bluntly, that could be as, as forcing entry to the property and turning the gas off because at that point it's now safe. Uh, but that's a piece of, that that is a piece of legislation that you can use for that purpose. Uh, so, but like I say, we're we're looking to develop that as a more formalised policy, uh, and like I say, looking at sort of more you know more stringent sort of enforcement working with our tenants. And like I say, on the high risk buildings, I think we'll also be having to look to that do that work with leaseholders as well. Uh, because again it's sort of we don't have any responsibility at the moment under the terms of the lease to go into a leaseholder's flat and do that type of work for them uh, but that I think that could could change how we have to sort of work with leaseholders on that okay. Simon. Paul is it not a condition of the tenancy that they allow the council in to to do Are you just listening I thought surely as a tenant you have to be re you are obliged to allow the council in so it, it actually they're breaching their tenancy if they refuse technically yes uh but surely a bit more than technically if we wanted to enforce it it's difficult though again like i say it's it's always difficult isn't it to just force access into a property uh which like i say using the gas safety legislation actually Obviously, makes life easier yeah. because the courts are generally quite willing to act to, to allow you to force entry if you need to th for that one because it is a recognized safety issue you know. And also, as I understood it, gas was treated separately because it's seen as an explosive mm. issue. To, to and in that sense, mm. slightly. Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest with you, most of it is around carbon monoxide, realistically, right. in, in properties, because that's the bit that is likely to sort of cause those injuries. I mean, a gas leak, I suspect more often than not, is probably through an accident or incident mm. rather than just an issue that develops over time. Uh, but like I say, using that, using that legislation is easier than sort of trying to use the tenancy side of things because again, a court might, you know, for for general repair type stuff, a court might not be that sort of lenient or you know may maybe a bit more lenient towards the tenant. So it, it's just easier to use that piece yeah. of legislation. No, I could understand a bit about if you if you've asked them to repair a, a sink and you choose not to let people in, then you carry on with your broken sink. Mm. But it just seems a bit odd mm. <laughs> that we're, we're struggling to get 
our own tenants to let us into our own properties to do the repairs. That, that's what yeah. I wanted to understand. I, I think just to clarify, Chair, I mean, in Not terms, you in terms, in of, gas service, in terms yeah. of gas servicing, we have very we have very good access rights. No, it wasn't the gas, it was yeah. the electric. It was, I was yeah. picking up your point yeah. about needing to take them to court mm. to do electrical repairs, which I, I, seemed to I, be yeah. a really difficult... I, I, I think, you know, again, Chair, sort of gas, I think, is... is, is is well settled in people's minds. It's sort of people understand it. It's been around for a long time, and I think people generally get it. Mm. Electrical, perhaps not so much. Uh, you know, so again, I think over time, as we, you know, again, as we sort of become stronger in terms of our enforcement to that side of stuff, again, it will it will set in people's minds, won't it? Whereas gas, I think it's just it's been around for yeah. so long, and, and that gas servicing requirement's been around for so long. People just almost take it for granted now that we come every year, service your gas appliances and do that side of it. Whereas I say electrical, not so much. So, you know, I, I, I think it'll come with time. Thank you. Rosie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just out of interest, um, do we know what uh, the main blockers are for people not letting you into the property? To be honest with you, no. Uh, There'll be various reasons why people people don't let you in. As I say, I think with gas, it it's sort of it. People understand it. They know the dangers of gas. It's it's been drummed into people's heads around gas safety and gas servicing that they they almost take it for granted now that you come and do it. A lot of the other stuff, it's if they don't see it as being a problem, people sometimes don't want to inconvenience themselves and they see it as being a mess and you know creating that sort of creating a mess for themselves and having to have time off or you know making access arrangements for you and if they don't perceive there to be any benefit to them in doing that sometimes they don't want to let you in uh, and I think that's across a lot of stuff we get that you know that people will let you in if they if they want something at the end of it but if if they don't see anything in it for themselves at the end of it sometimes they don't want to let you in uh, and I think that's probably one of the big blockers uh, because you know we work on an appointment system uh, we, we can accommodate reasonably people's requests, you know, obviously you know, we don't work 24-7 on that type of work, uh, but, you know, we can reasonably accommodate people's requests. So there's no reason why people shouldn't be able to book an appointment at a time that suits them. Uh, but, like I say, it's just, it, it, it has been just historically a bit of an issue for us on the electrical side. Thanks, Paul. Any, yeah, Rosie? Yeah, thank you for that. I, I understand that. Um, do you agree then it's probably a communication issue that if we were to communicate with the residents the importance of having these electrical checks and maybe the, the on-site people could do that, um, it might increase the amount of people letting you actually into the properties? Potentially. And I, th and I think this is, what, this is what we're talking about really, sort of having that sort of stronger policy, making sure that's put out there as to why we're doing it and why it's important and also for people to see that if they don't allow us in and that they don't cooperate that we might have to take that sort of same type of enforcement as we do with gas and hopefully the combination of those sort of stressing the importance of it but also saying that we're serious about it and that, that if you don't let us in we will do something to make sure we do get in that that hopefully will get that message across to people uh, but like I say, it does come down to that thing of I don't think we'll ever convince people that there's a real benefit to them uh, at the end of it, other than sort of, you know, stressing the safety elements of it. Uh, but, you know, people will still go along and plug, you know, 20 things into a plug socket on, you know, multiple extension leads as soon as we walk out the door. And that's just the nature of the way people are, I'm afraid. And they, they, they don't always perceive the, the potential dangers of uh, electrical safety. Any other questions, further questions? No? Okay. So thanks, Paul, for your update and presentation and um, allowing us to sort of grill you a little bit and, and feedback some, some information. And certainly we'll welcome you back once you've had time to um, digest some of the, uh, the stuff that you only got on Monday. Um, and perhaps we'll get you back in... In, in 12 months time or as and when you've got something significant that you can update us on so uh, thank you um, and you're welcome to, to, to leave yeah, thanks if, chair if you, if so I will much. circulate some information through uh, Joe's team just sort of some of the briefing notes that the government has sent out just so you've got something that you can sort of see what's involved in it
that would be useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, we move on to item eight, which is the local development scheme and local plan timetable. Um, so, th so this report is is scheduled to be uh, considered by cabinet, I think, on uh, on Thursday, as I uh, recall. Um, so we've got obviously Councillor Doyle, we've got Anna Miller, and um, Richard Powell to uh, to take us through this. So, um, Steve, I don't know if you want to introduce and sort of give us a little bit of the background to to this uh, to this report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The purpose of this report is to seek approval for the publication of Tamworth Borough Council's Local Plan Development Scheme. To note the recommendations we discussed in ISAG, oh, actually, this is for tomorrow's night. In summary, Section 15 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act of 2004 requires all local planning authorities to prepare and maintain a local development scheme and specifies what is to be included in it. Failure to maintain a local development scheme could result in one being prepared by the Secretary of State. Now I'm going to cut that short there. If you want to see the full uh, speech, come along tomorrow night. If not, I'm going to hand over to Richard Powell because it's his report and he'll give you the in-depth. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, I'll keep it brief because as I say it's, it's all in the report and then if you've got any questions on specific bits of it, then we can just uh, do the bits you're interested in. So, uh, as Stephen said, the, the report's going to Cabinet tomorrow, seeking approval for the adoption of the, the new local development framework, which supersedes the one that's currently out there, um, which is now out of date. That set a time frame from a while ago for the development of a new local plan, but for a number of reasons, it, it didn't progress uh, along that time frame. So. We've been waiting a little bit uh, in terms of what the government's been saying about potential changes to the system, but we're at the point now where we sort of need to crack on with the new plan because ours has just passed five years old um, in, in February. Um, so last year we did a, a, a review of the plan in terms of how it's performing against its performance indicators and uh, in line with uh, national policy and sort of came to the conclusion um, that it's, it's broadly in line with with uh, national policy, um, but there's various changes uh, in certain areas of the plan and new priorities, both nationally and locally, uh, that make it worthwhile basically having a whole new plan, uh, and that the old time frame for developing one wasn't quite appropriate. Uh, so this is what the local development uh, scheme does, it sort of sets out the broad time frame for that. Um, it's required it's, it's a mandatory requirement and it's supposed to be kept up to date, uh, published on the website, and it sort of sets out what documents will form part of the development plan for Tamworth once they're um, all developed and adopted, and a time a timetable for the, that sort of development, but over a period of three years uh, at least. And so the three-year program is, is uh, in the local development scheme, uh, and it's sort of supposed to inform the public about the opportunities to get involved in the process. Um, at the various stages of consultation. So just at the back of the local development scheme, we've got this sort of indicative timetable. Now it's sort of, uh, it's it's a bit broad at the minute in terms of the the, the times when the things are going to happen because last times was quite specific and if you don't stick to it, then uh, people start ringing up and asking questions. So if you keep it a bit broader, it's easy to be a little bit more flexible about it. So in terms of the local plan, what we've got, is for uh, spring 2022 the first sort of round of consultation on issues and options uh, and then sort of early on in 2023 the move to the preferred options stage and have another round of consultation there um, with a view to developing the sort of pre-submission version of the plan towards the end of 2023 early, early 2024 with a, a, a view to submit for examination sort of late on in 2024 so it's quite an ambitious time frame as I think the average is sort of seven years nationally um, but that's the plan currently to fit into those uh, three years just a little bit more than three years and there's various other um, supplementary planning documents that we've adopted along along the way as well that will be reviewed as part of that as well uh, and also SIL which I think isn't isn't on here but that was adopted in 2018 and 
there'll be a review of that along the way that's kind of rolled into all of this as well. Um, have you got anything to add at this stage, Anna? No? Thank you. Um, okay, so a couple of comments from me. How, how does the local plan working group fit in with this framework? Um, well, it doesn't have to be sort of specified in this document because this is the public facing bit that sort of says when the public can get involved. But um, we we are obviously planning to sort of reconvene the local plan working group um, sort of as soon as possible, basically, be before these issues and options stage. And then obviously all the stages in between the sort of we've had a few previously and they were quite spread out, but obviously they'll need to be sort of more more regular depending on what stage of the, the plan we're at. Um, but no, that is on the to-do list to, to reconvene that before we get to this point so that we can get that input early on. Okay, thank you. And then from a, I guess from a, from a member point of view, do we need to funnel ideas or, or, or potential, um, Changes through the local plan working group. Is that the is that the um, the mechanism that we that we use? Um, I think yes, preferably just because it's a bit neater in terms of the the approach. But I mean, obviously, when when there's any opportunity to get involved, that's that's fine. Um, but yes, preferably, I think because it's just a bit it's a bit more formal then. Um, that's who. Yeah. With the working group, it sits, it monitors the process for planning and the local plan, and it will, it'll be there consistently feeding back in any um, ideas or changes that we want to make to the local plan. If they're not adapted in the current one, then they're uh, marshaled, ready for the review of the next one. So it always sits there. It sit, kind of sits outside of the process in that respect, pretty much like a scrutiny uh, community will do. And it will feed back in any changes that are to be made. Is that fair enough? Um, I, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I think that would be a really good mecha mechanism because the, the working group is cross-party and the working group, really the remit of that is a lot of policy development. So that's the point where you can really get involved and influence what those policies look like at the various draft stages of the plan prior to the consultation at the various stages. So I probably would support that as a mechanism. I have, an, I have another question on the on the um, the local plan working group. Actually, when was the last time it met? Do do you, do you know? Yeah, it last met. I can't give you dates, but it last met to discuss some very specific legislation. Um, so responses to two particular consultations. I'm I'm going to say September and October of last year. One was the, the planning white paper, which seeks to radically reform, potentially radically reform, the planning system to make it simpler and streamline it again. Um, so that was one. Um, and then there was a second consultation on standard methodology, which is a way of calculating our housing need as an authority. So we worked quite closely with the working group. Um, we put responses into government on both of those two really key consultation papers that came out of MHCLG. Um, so that was the last time we met. Um, not strictly policy related, but that was a really good sounding board for that particular sort of activity that we had at the time. Th thanks, Anna. Um, Simon. Thanks, Chair. Um, with regard to the local plan working group, it, it was used as a sounding board for the officers to come to the full uh, open meeting with all the councillors about, for example, the white paper. So there was some sense in which, if you like, the, the broader understanding and, and detail had been able to be discussed as a, well, what, what's the first reaction of members have got to this? And 
you know, what might be a perspective from officers was then melded in with what might be the perspective from members. And therefore, when we came to the bigger meeting, it, it actually flowed more easily through the seminar that was used because some of it, some of the questions that might come up had been anticipated or, or at least could the areas of, of uncertainty, you know, well, actually, we don't know what the government will do about that yet, but at least we know now that's something that's important. Um, with with regard to this process, I mean, clearly, this has got to happen, There's, you know, and, and it's good in a way because we know that, so we don't need to listen to Councillor Dawes long speech. Um, we can take the short version as, as, as being all that's needed. Um, but uh, from a practical point of view, I think the really important thing now is that we get stuck into, as members, the local plan, because you know, there was some controversy at the end of a former councillor's term um, where you know, issues were raised that might have been better raised if they'd been raised when the local plan was being put together. Um, so I think it is really beholden on members now to look at their area and their local plan and what it means. Because the reference that both Councillor Doyle and, and Anna's made, and Richard's made, to the issues. You know, if we've got to build a certain number of homes, and under the latest planning reform, it would actually go back up rather than whereas the previous one had taken it down, then we've got to have an agreement with neighbouring authorities. And my question to Richard would just be, with regard to the timetable, how is that going to fit together? Because our special position <laughs> means that our plan won't go through without some discussion with Litchfield, some discussion with North Warwick, um, and, and, you know, there is still that massive development pending. Um, uh, you know, does the meaningful gap mean anything? So those are things which, you know, if you're a Stony Delft Council, the meaningful gap is the gap between you and 1,500 homes in the next town over which you've got no say. So those are things which I think be really good. And maybe we could ask that at some future point, subject to obviously what everybody thinks about the... Um, forward plan for the committee that we could perhaps get Richard and Anna to come back and talk about those bits which are less familiar we all probably hopefully know something about our ward um, but the interactions would be quite an interesting explanation for with, and, and Councillor Jay earlier referred to me as age before beauty when we both press to speak so I'm going to reverse it now and say as, as newer members might find it interesting to actually know how our plan has to dovetail with that of the neighbours so I think that could be a useful follow up to this report and it would encourage us to get involved in well, what, what's the impact for our wards just suggestion obviously mm -hmm. rely on support from others Th Thank you Simon Tina yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've read this report in quite depth and I've also read a number of um, neighbouring authorities ones as well I, that Simon's just mentioned, um, North Warwickshire, um, Sutton Coalfield, Litchfield. Everybody seems to avo be avoiding the issue of how HS2 is going to affect our local plan. It's going to do loads, so much damage to Tamworth, to the residents, to the wildlife, and there's no, there's no mention of that in here. Um, it's going to be of no benefit to anybody living in Tumworth unless you, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, and I know we have somebody that works on the railways here, so he will definitely be different to me. Um, and there's also no me no mention of you know climate change and our where are EV chargers going to fit into homes going forwards, because at the moment you get a grant of three hundred and fifty pound going forward that that government scheme is not going to be there, and people are going to be paying. 600 700 pound for them so i think you know going forward our local plan needs to look at look at that if we're going to build quality housing and and homes then we need to make sure that there is with their future proofed in a way because at the moment they're not if you want an ev uh, an ev vehicle you have to pay for that ev charger and i think developers local plan and and boroughs need to be looking at that before we we go neutral in what is it 2030 uh, uh carbon neutral just a couple of points I, I get that those can be fed into the into the working group 
and I'll look forward to having that being set back up because there's a number of things in here that are going to affect Tamworth massively that are not included in my opinion. Thanks, Tina. I think... Chair, um, can I just say, by the way, that the one about electrical supply was actually raised initially through the working group in the sense of, I remember Councillor Standen saying, you know, hang on a minute, if everybody in this new 900 house development has an electric charger, will the grid cope? Which is, and, we, and the answer was, of course, no. So I think it's really valuable um, what has been added there. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, just a couple of couple of points there that I kind of like to just uh, just comment on. Um, I think Tina's Teen, right about this. There's, there's certainly some concerns in different areas, but again, I think that is something that needs to be fed through the the, the local plan working group as opposed to kind of what like, what we're looking looking at tonight, which is the is the timeline in in effect and the framework for it. Um, and I think Simon's right about the again about the um, the EV stuff. Um, I, I, I recall actually that 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 was a recommendation that went through cabinet a number of years ago, actually um, th through through scrutiny committee. That inf the infrastructure for for EV should be included within any future review of the local plan so so I, I guess a little as, as, as Stephen's here that's a just a little prompter and a reminder <laughs> um, quick question on me that you mentioned about the target dates and that it's it does seem quite aggressive for for perhaps what is industry standard um, I'm, I'm guessing that is because we're a small authority um, and perhaps haven't got as much land to share about and, and do things with so um, is that the the reason or is there anything else behind that aggressive timetable um, no, that's the theory that there's, there's, <laughs> there's yeah, there's, it's not as complex. I mean, there are obviously a lot of complex issues, but it's not like some of the bigger boroughs where they've got a lot of a lot of land and a lot of argument over what's going where and when and things like that. It's it should be in theory a bit more straightforward. Um, I think f for <laughs> brave words, yeah, brave words. Yeah, yeah. But it's diff it's different issues. It's different. It's di but it's yeah. Um, and we've also done a bit of we've also done a bit of work already in terms of the evidence base and those kind of things. And there's also potentially the changes to the system coming along, which might throw this whole thing out anyway and have to take a different approach along the way. So in theory, what we're trying to do is is front load as much of it as possible, but allow us to sort of pivot to the new approach if we have to without scrapping the whole thing part way through so if we can get as much done as possible before the rules change because there'll obviously be a transitionary period coming in if we're outside of it we'd have to just sort of scrap whatever we can't use from what we've done so far and start again whereas if we're within the within the transitionary period we can carry on and there's also obviously uh, government requirements for everyone to have an up-to-date plan I think it's 2023 uh, what that means for us is, is difficult because uh, we still consider it to be up to date at this point despite it being five years old but in two years time it might you know that might that position might have changed but we won't then have a new plan in place by then so we've obviously got to try to get as quickly as possible into a position where we can say we've got a new plan coming uh, if our old one gets considered to be out of date Thank you. Yeah, I, I like the aggressive timetable. I just have perhaps some concerns that, um, in 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 effect, that maybe our the fact we haven't got much much space m perhaps makes some nego future negotiations perhaps might take a little bit more time. But um, I, I guess that's for for you guys to uh, 
to deal with. Um, okay, any other comments or questions? Simon. Can I just formally move we endorse the report and take it forward to Cabinet? I'm happy to second that if, uh, if, no, if nobody else is, yeah? And uh, I, w I would also add that um, I, th I think as, as, the, as the local plan working group isn't a formal, a formal committee meeting, that perhaps we should think about whether we can have any, any influence from a scrutiny point of view overarching that and it might be a discussion for a for a future a future meeting or with with officers but um, I just thought I'd share those thoughts any any comments Stephen? what I would say is with the discussions that went on with the white paper it actually come to members first and then went into the working group so it's not as though members don't get to see what's happening or what goes into the working group if you use that as an instance and it, I, I think it actually worked quite well um, in terms of formalizing it with us um, the only thing that you need to be careful there is how many scrutiny committees does it have to go through before something gets done that's the only thing uh, that I'd bear in mind. Anna. I was just going to say that the usefulness of the working group is that it's not a decision-making committee because we can have confidential discussions, you know, without the public, you know, in the room, so to speak. So when we are talking about where we might put houses, which communities might be impacted upon, which policies are going to drive growth generally or conserve and enhance the environment within Tamworth. We can, we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. And that then doesn't get recycled back to us at an examination in public or by residents who might want to put in objections saying, well, you nearly did that, but then you moved it over there. And so, you know, it, it's, it's confidential. Um, and I know you can treat committees with exempt reports, but I do find the working group is more of an informal discussion, which is, um, it, it's mm -hmm. a bit more free-flowing, if you like, and no idea is silly, and you, you, you throw it in and you see what comes out. So I quite like that about the working group, which is why I like that, and perhaps scrutiny is, is perhaps a little bit more formalised and not as, oh. I don't want to say useful, but it's, diff it's different, it's a different type of meeting. Th thanks, Anna. Yeah, I, w I would, I'm, I'm not saying, don't have the working group. Mm. I'm saying there's a there's a there's a place for the local plan to come through scrutiny. Really, I, I, I guess that's what I'm saying, Simon. Uh, Chair, I think if I'm right in saying that in the past, the final local plan always comes to full council anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But admittedly, by then it's largely, um, well, it's a combat package by that point. But what I would say is that um, what you could do, and I mean this is only my advice and I'm sure the Conservative group will mull it over, but if there's a concern that it's not including a, wire, a cross section of the controlling group, then you could change the composition from the controlling group, which at the moment is dominated by members of the Cabinet. So you could decide that one, say, one member of, of, of the controlling group's group is not a member of the cabinet, so that, if you like, there's a, you know, a an extraneous but relevant input. But what I would say, and I think was borne out when we had the initial discussion of the government draft bill, that well, the consultation that came out, was that it freed all the members to discuss it from a Tamworth perspective I as you've seen in these meetings try not to be you know partisan on those meetings and treat them as they're meant to be but equally it allowed members of the government group to say well actually for us here maybe this doesn't work 
and we were then able to decide how much of that could go into the public forum and it was a very constructive process but I think if if you want my advice would be to you to have the the local plan as a scrutiny item and maybe over two or three meetings look at the north the south or whatever at the town i think wards is a bit artificial because you know any decision on i mean our, we're a small town so any decision in one ward almost always impacts on at least the one next door so i think it would be good to maybe review it in that way and then feed that on block into the uh, working group but one of the issues that came out last time was that planning is not a policy making committee and I, I always found that a bit odd because all the people who are on planning were the very ones who could tell you whether certain policies were working in practice you know if an application had come up well we've got this policy yes we can't really enforce it you know that was the sort of thing that would have been really useful and that's why the policy working the plan, um, local plan working group came up was a way of being able to feed in things that had emerged from the planning committee or from relevant committees but which couldn't be discussed in planning because planning is a quasi judicial body and therefore has to focus only on decisions so I would suggest there would be a value in us having a look at areas of the town going forward and after all I say as its infrastructure and growth would <laughs> legitimately have a very strong argument for being the lead on giving members an opportunity to come because non-members of the committee can come and uh, put a pitch in about an issue in their area and and it's a, an easy way to do that because scrutiny they wouldn't be able to vote in the end but I mean most of us would be happy that if someone from another ward came along with issues relating to their ward and the local plan most of us would say well fine put them on the list of issues to be considered because we're not going to tell each other what each ward's needs are if you see what I mean thanks and there's a benefit that some of us live in other wards and can chip in on that one as well thanks Simon yeah I, th I think I think there's there's opportunities and possibilities moving for moving forward on that but perhaps it's a perhaps it's a discussion for a slightly different time but uh, yeah so we so the report's been moved and seconded so um, all those in favor So that's unanimous, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Richard, Stephen, um, you're, free to, you're free to go, and fortunately you've had no calls, Anna, that you've needed to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.